talking about uh, investment climate. A lot of great people coming on stage. Let's shift around a little bit who's uh, going and moving around. But I'm really happy to invite uh, the moderator on stage first, Richard Horning. I don't think he needs a lot of introduction. He's uh, probably the w most well-known connection between Estonia and Silicon Valley, serving as the honorary consul, actually, for Estonia and Silicon Valley and uh, has an extensive legal career and, and a lot of things uh, that you probably know him for. But I know probably most people know that he's the co-founder of Latitude as well. And when I asked him what is something that people might not know, and I think this is really interesting, is that actually he was the man who came up with Latitude 59's name. What's, how, what's the story? Did it just come to your heads or what was the... No, it... it uh... Andres Virg and I founded this conference uh, 10 years ago, and we, you know, we had 56 people in the room the first time at the Radisson Blue in a small conference room. It grew, and by the time the fourth year came along, uh, we realized that we needed to come up with a branding strategy since it seemed like we had some traction. And so there was a meeting at a, a law firm here in Tallinn, and a bunch of the people who were involved in the, in the infrastructure tossing around various names having to do with the Arctic Circle and snow and uh, these kinds of things. And I'm looking at the map on the wall, and I said, what's the, what's the latitude that, that passes through uh, Tallinn? And somebody looked it up, and it was Latitude 59. And I said, if we use the name Latitude 59 and we tell people we picked that name because 150 kilometers or miles either side of Latitude 59, you capture all of the capital cities of the Nordic and Baltic region. Beautiful. And that's, that's the way it's started. Ten years We're later, here. here we are with, with people from all over the world, not just the Nordic and Baltic region. Great. So I'm going to leave the stage to you to introduce your panelists. Well, I'm just going to invite them all up on absolutely. the stage. Please, panel, come and join us. And they're each going to introduce them, themselves. But I'm going to set the, the tone for the, for the proceedings. Um, I noticed in the paper, uh, as I was on my way here from San Francisco, that a famous American economist named William Baumol died at the beginning of the month. He's probably the most famous economist that never won the Nobel Prize, and now that he died, he won't. He made the observation that the difference between rich countries and poor countries was technology. It was technology that, that increases the wealth of economies because it, it leverages productivity, which in turn turns into wealth of the country itself and the wealth of the individual participants. Well, technology by itself doesn't do the trick. You have to have people who, who introduce the technology, leverage the technology, multiply it and put it to use, which means Ultimately, entrepreneurs. Entrepreneurs are the key to, to the growth of, of economies and the, and the growth of, of societies. And without entrepreneurs, uh, you know, we'll all be back in, in uh, horse carts and, and stone wheel vehicles. We, 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 we all grow up having the idea of the essential food groups. In my case, it's uh, steak tartare, palm frites, uh, Argentinian Malbec, and key lime pie. But for entrepreneurs, the essential food groups to grow entrepreneurial companies are capital, mentors, minimum viable product, and customer traction. It, it gets stated a number of ways, and, and, and a team to drive the engine. So we have on the panel today a group of people who have been involved in that whole ecosystem who not only do, are they involved in the, the supplying of capital in a, in a hum location, but they also are involved in working with companies that are working on the other aspects of growing technology companies. So with that introduction, we're going to talk about globalization, disruption, the state of the of the financial participation in the entrepreneurial economy. I'm going to ask each one of the, our panelists to introduce themselves, talk about what they do for a living, and then we'll, we'll have a little dialogue. And unlike earlier panels, where's, that, where's, the, where's the box? Where's that box? Yeah. I, I, I'd like the box to get thrown around the room while we're talking. 
so that we can have a little audience participation in the discussion. So, you know, raise your hand, have the box thrown to you, and we'll, we'll take your question, you know, along the way. Go ahead. Hi, uh, my name is Connor Murphy. Uh, I'm from Latitude 52. I'm uh, from Cork, Ireland, and Latitude 52 is also Berlin, Germany, uh, where I'm uh, managing director at Techstars. Uh, I'm focused on investing in B2B SaaS machine learning startups for a new program with SAP in Berlin. And before that, I was an entrepreneur and computer scientist. Yeah. Right. So, Yari Mieskonen from Kono Venture Partners from Helsinki, Stockholm, London. We are active early stage investor in Nordic and Baltic area, but we help our companies to grow international. So actually half of our companies have headquarters either in London, Vienna, New York or Silicon Valley. Good morning, Elgur Zilmas with 3TS Capital Partners. We are a regional VC investing in Central Eastern Europe and Baltics. Uh, we are currently investing from our fourth fund, which is about 110 million euros. Uh, we are proud investors in Funderbeam and Next, which is upstairs. They have an office here. Would you, would you mention something about the Draper Venture Network that you're a part yes, of? Yes. Um, good point. Thanks for reminding, Richard. Uh, we are also a member of Draper Venture Networks, uh, which is a global network of VCs, uh, brainchild of Tim Draper. I'm sure you guys know him. Um, and we've been a member for two years. The network basically spans across uh, five continents, and most of these VCs in the network help uh, in due diligence, syndication, uh, business development for startups, um, and I think Funderbeam has been benefiting from it uh, with the network. So, yeah. yeah Tim, Tim, uh, Tim Draper and his fund uh, invested in Funderbeam at, at last year's conference. Yep. When he was the keynote speaker. Hey, um, my name is Louis Copé. I work for Point Nine Capital. Uh, we are VC firm out of Berlin, but investing globally. Uh, we do six-stage deals uh, in SaaS and marketplaces companies, and the more it goes, and the more we finance like more uh, companies with deep tech uh, components. Um, and before that, I was working in venture industry as well in the fund uh, out of Paris called Alpin Capital, and I spent the last year studying like blockchain topics at uh, MIT. Elizabeth, good morning. My name is Elizabeth Fullerton. I'm from Silicon Valley, San Francisco. Um, I'm an angel investor for my family office and family uh, foundation. I focus on deep tech, educational, uh, more impact investing. Okay. Please. Morning. My name is Kinga Stanisławska. I come from Xperior Venture Fund, which I founded about four years ago. It was a first time fund set up in Warsaw. Um, the original uh, investment region was Poland, and now we're expanding into Central and Europe, in Eastern Europe. We're looking to take all our companies to a wider region, and that's very important for us. We're a very small fund. We work very closely with entrepreneurs, and I think that's the biggest va added value. Uh, my partner is also here today, and we're meeting with a number of startups. Uh, my name is Magnus Ride, and I'm based in uh, Silicon Valley. I've been there, but I'm born and raised in Stockholm, and we're raising a new fund uh, to invest in Nordic and Baltic uh, high-tech companies, uh, mainly in uh, what we call KETs, or Key Enabling Technologies, which is um, sort of semiconductor, photonics, material science, an area that we feel has a lot of potential and is underinvested in right now. Okay, well, let's, let's start with you, Magnus, uh, since you're in the process of raising a fund. Yeah. What is the climate for fundraising? What is the climate for, for raising the amounts of capital to invest in the next generation of entrepreneurs? Uh, are we expecting a, a, a bubble bursting when Uber's valuation drops 50%? <laughs> and how will that affect the, the climate? Yeah, so we are very, our fund's gonna be different than most funds. In the case, as I described, we're gonna raise capital to invest in companies that traditionally do require a lot of capital to reach maturity and take a long time. So that's not what most VCs go today. They've been there, many of them, and done that and walked away from it. So, but we are uh, uh, looking at uh, uh, going against the trend in that area. And uh, we have received a lot of, I would say, uh, support. Uh, there is clearly a need in the market. We worked very hard here in Europe 
I've been to Brussels and Luxembourg, I don't know how many times, talking about this. I've been to Asia. Uh, I think the uh, concept is right, but the first commitment, financial commitment, we're talking period of large fund, somewhere between 300 and 500 million euros where we're uh, raising. And um, so you gotta get the first big, big commitment in, and then I think the pieces will fall in. So, um, so, that's, so it's a challenge, it's very challenging. Uh, the second question about the bubble bursting, um, I do think that's coming. I mean, we've seen that so many times, it goes up and down, and, and uh, so, and, and I think in a way that's gonna be good for us. I hope that we get our fun before it happens, <laughs> because uh, up and running, because what's gonna happen then, as has happened before, is that people are gonna move away from that sector, because it's being over-invested in now. It's clearly uh, a paradise for those that have a hot idea, to get funding in that sp space, but it's gonna collapse, it's gonna come. Uh, I'm pretty sure, I don't know when. And then people are gonna look at new areas to invest in and swing back. And this goes on, I mean, those who were around the year 2000 and saw that bubble burst, if you had any dot com around in your name, you were, you know, were a pariah. So everybody changed direction then. Then it was clean tech for a while, and now that's a pariah, and so forth, so. And just to give you a little perspective on the consequences of the bubble bursting. In the last quarter of 1999, the first quarter of 2000, uh, the venture capital community of the United States invested $29 billion in each of those quarters. By the middle of 2001, it was $7 billion. So that tells you how dramatic the, the, imp, the uh, bubble bursting effect was. And the unemployment rate in Silicon Valley went from 1.2%, there was no one that didn't have a job, to 10% in the space of a year and a half. So there are consequences of the bubble bursting. So, but, you know, in the, in the, in the sense of, of um, the, the economy ahead of, which, you know, you guys at Counter Ventures have been at this for a long time. You, your, your fund has been around in investing in companies that don't take quite so long to mature as the kind that that Magnus is talking about. What's your observation on the state of money raising and the state of the uh, uh, economy in terms of the attitude towards investors? Are we, are we at a point where everybody's worried about the bubble bursting and you better get the money into your pocket because when it happens, there won't be any? Well, uh, there's no simple answer, I suppose. We are also at animal. We invest in hardware as well. It's part of our focus area. It takes time and it's, it's uh, the problem is exit market. It's easy to invest, but it's very slow to exit. And in Europe, there hasn't been uh, many funds who are fond of hardware. And that's a little problem for small funds like us because it's very hard to find co-investors. Only CVCs are active in that field, which is of course helpful, but then you may fall into the trap that you are also locked into the one only exit channel. But uh, I think the ecosystem is, is quite dynamic and, and I hope healthy as, as well. In whole Nordic Baltic area, there's a lot of activities as we all see startup communities blooming, but also new venture funds are popping up. Unfortunately, most of them are too small to make a difference. So they are like 20 million euro funds or 30 million euro funds. Of course, you can seed up deals, but you cannot follow up. And that has been always a problem in Europe that uh, even in Nordic countries, it's hard to make, uh, let's say, plus 20 million euro investments. Now there's a few larger funds uh, raised uh, lately like EQT and uh, Atomico who can do that. They don't do hardware. So I think mm -hmm. Magnus has a point there and uh, hopefully you will get your fund up and running. <laughs> Kinga, you, you're, you're, you have a relatively small fund and you invest at much earlier stages than, than Magnus and, and Yari are talking about. What's your perspective on, on the market? We feel that there is a very positive uh, trend in Poland and Central Europe in terms of uh, support from raising new money. Uh, it hasn't happened yet, but the support is there. And there's a lot of discussions on how to uh, catalyze institutional investors to go into the VC field. Now, unfortunately, we are not there yet. Th this is the big issue. Um, the first such success in terms of institutional investment actually happened this year in Poland 
were the largest insurance company invested into Atomico, was one of their investments, actually two more venture funds. And uh, we haven't seen that happen for the last 10 or 15 years. So really, it was a big thing. Now, even if the investment amounts are small, it still shows that there will be a growing trend of this. And I know that there is a bunch of German and, and um, Swedish funds now going to Poland, trying to get the Polish insurance companies to invest. Um, we're looking to see how we can catalyze more institutions like this. But obviously, in the region, there's not that many of them anyway. Um, the European institutions, the EIF, is one of the biggest supporters of the venture sector across Europe. The EBRD is supporting across Central and Eastern Europe. So, but, you know, these are very, very few institutions if you can name them in a list. When we set up Xperior, we um, managed to gather around 29 private investors. And this is how we started out. So going after individuals who have made it in the past, who set up their companies and sold them, was the best way to go, and that's how we succeeded. What's the, what, what, in your opinion, has been the obstacle, the, uh, the, 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 the barrier to the large pools of capital in Poland and Central Europe into diversifying their portfolio of investments in putting some of it into venture? If you've said the largest was an insurance company or bank just insurance invested in, company. In, in Atomico, which ought to be a, 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 a pace setter, but I get the impression the pace is still too slow. Pace is definitely too slow. Uh, in the past, in Europe, there's been a lot of regulatory issues around that and a lot of misunderstanding. Um, by and large, it wasn't really seen as a good thing to have double management fees, for example, um, and lack of liquidity. You have to be a quite a large institution to be able to put a small amount of your money into something that's relatively illiquid from their point of view. And even getting money into private equity funds across uh, the region has always been very difficult. What they tended to do is go to the US for that. So uh, I think we still need to educate the financial institutions across Central Europe, across the Baltics, in terms of the benefits of investing into BC. And definitely, government pressure helps because when uh, there is a national strategy to focus on innovation, it's always a good thing if they keep talking about it. <laughs> Even if it's not a material difference, it's always good to talk about it and to push the idea through. But how about in, in your, your area of the world? You invest broadly in Central and Eastern Europe. Yeah. Uh, you have a fund based uh, headquartered in Vienna for mm -hmm. and, and offices around. Yeah. What's, what's your observation about the willingness of large pools of capital to invest? Is it only family offices? Mm -hmm. What's the fundraising scene? Yeah. Well, over the years, we have seen a different pattern. I mean, right now, we've been in business for 15 years with four different funds. So there were different cycles uh, over the years. Right now we have, as you mentioned, EBRD, IF, heavy investors in the region. Um, we cover six offices uh, with 15 people, so we are also in touch with local uh, LPs. And most of the corporates are still shying away from VC asset class. What we see is uh, high net worth individuals who have made some money in a startup or exited uh, their company are interested to get into the game again, but uh, it's nowhere close to the US levels. Uh, the region is very capital thirsty. When you look at um, VC money going for GDP per capita, uh, VC money for capita, it's uh, minuscule compared to US or Israel or different markets. So uh, the trends are in the right direction, but it's never, never enough. Uh, we also see a lot of uh, early stage funds being set up with Jeremy type of programs. Uh, they pump in a lot of cash into the uh, early stage deals, seed stage deals. But these are all mostly first-time funds, so they need to raise a second fund, a third fund to continue. We come in basically on the growth stage, so we work with most of the early stage funds um, as we are investing somewhere between three and five million euros per deal. Uh, but we see uh, a plethora of these funds coming in, you know, good portfolio companies, but they lack the capital to go to the next phase. Um, and on the LPs, there's appetite, but uh, with the pension funds or insurance companies, there's a little bit of hesitation still to make the commitment, the large commitment, uh, into a VC fund. And we get the questions about the track record, the macroeconomic situation in the region, 
you know, a little bit of currency volatility, politics sometimes play a role, uh, especially we have seen in Turkey, uh, where I'm from actually. Mm -hmm. So um, it's challenging, but that's where, why we are here in this region, because it's a, um, it's a competitive market for us. We are competing with funds from Western Europe and uh, US. Uh, and most of these companies, as they become more visible, we see that uh, most of the US money and Western European money is flowing into the region, but you need a local uh, fund base. And I think uh, the exit market is also a, a challenge because you don't see many domestic M&A activity in Poland or Turkey or the Czech Republic. You see mostly Western companies coming and buying these companies here. Um, so yeah, it is going in the right direction, but it's not there yet. It's not even close. And there is no bubble in our region. I mean, <laughs> uh, in the U.S. you have the abundance of the capital and the number of startups. But in our region, I think the mostly we are concerned with burn rates going up slightly. Um, the, the, t the high level valuation numbers are not that uh, worrisome because they are mostly outliers. We don't see those unicorn valuations here in the region yet. Uh, there are a few going in that direction, which is good. Uh, but looking at the U.S. from a distance, we also have some companies that we have import, exported to U.S. Uh, some of them went public, some of them got acquired. What we see is um, the valuations are, yes, a little bit higher. Average seed round is more expensive. Uh, ticket sizes are larger. But also the burn rates are crazy compared to what we are dealing with in our region. So uh, it's interesting, the contrast. Uh, Elizabeth, you, you actually uh, travel the world as part of your investment strategy. I know you were at H Farm and the Veneto earlier this uh, last month. Yep. Why, why, why are you traveling the world when there are plenty of opportunities to be an angel investor within five miles of San Francisco where you live? It's cheaper elsewhere than <laughs> it is in America. You can get larger positions and make more of an impact um, as an angel investor. Um, the competition is not as fierce in America versus elsewhere. So, so I see a value proposition, right? Um, so for instance, um, I think that with my experiences, I can help companies elsewhere more quickly and get them to, um, to move across the pond. And then the reward is a lot bigger for me, right? Um, one, Venture is just a part of my portfolio. I come from a, sh a short and long. Um, so when the crash came, I had a balanced portfolio. So I was shorting all the <laughs> internet stocks, right? And then we were the ones with uh, capital when 2007, 8, 9 hit. And then we, we um, pretty much raised money through institution um, into and uh, we basically provided venture debt money. Again, when the markets are inefficient, we just stay away from volatility and then go into venture. So that's how we've um, managed our family money that way. Okay, mm -hmm. okay. You know, one of the things that, that happens uh, at the early stage is not only the application of capital, but the application of support and you two Folks, you know, spend your time, your particular funds have a reputation for being really hands-on with the early founders, the early entrepreneurs, and in, in, in helping them supply some of the other nutrition beyond the capital. So can you explain, you know, uh, you know what your thesis is about growing companies, you know, because it's not just money? Yeah, I agree on that. So uh, I think this is what actually important related to what you were saying before, meaning that when markets become competitive, you need to find a different shader. And in this case, I think, you know, I mean, Christoph, one of our partners, invested in SaaS in 2008 and invested his own money in Zendesk. And now Zendesk is a billion dollar company, but at the time there was not much competition. But if you look at it today, everybody here almost, ex except maybe from you to invest in, in SaaS companies. So you need to build some kind of differentiator. And for us, point nine, I think, so we do deals globally because we agree that we need to find not arbitrage opportunities, but at least opportunities that are not too expensive in different geo uh, locations. We just did a deal in Australia, for example, um, three or four months ago. And then when it comes to like winning deals, not only finding deals, I think having this expertise on one specific topic helps you a lot. So what we do at point nine is we are seven people doing deals. We do 10 to 15 deals a year. 
not more, which means that each of us is probably going to do one or two, which means that you have a lot of time actually to allocate to companies. And what we try to do is to build financial, but also strategic and operational expertise related to SaaS topics. So our thesis, if you want, is that from one industry to another, if you're SaaS companies, there are some kind of best practices that you can actually apply from one industry to another. So how do you recruit the right people at the beginning when you're a seed stage company, for example? How do you recruit the right marketer? How do you launch your content marketing strategy? What's the best recruitment in terms of sales that you need to do at different stages? These are a lot of topics on which we think that from one company to another, we can actually apply best practices. And this helps us quite a lot. And then we try to structure the community of like a portfolio entrepreneurs so that when you become a point nine portfolio company, you get plugged into a community of like 80 portfolio companies. Let's say 60 or 70% of them are actually SaaS companies anywhere in the globe. So let's say you're a French company and you want to go to the US, then we're going to find some other portfolio companies in the US that are probably going to help you find the right recruitments and maybe open doors when it comes to like selling your first deals in the US. So let's say for the first 12 to 18 months after the seed investment, this is where we think we can be the most hands-on and the most active to put the company on the right track so that they don't raise a Series A of like 2 to 3 million euro, but maybe more 10 or 15. And this happened already with a certain number of companies. An example is Algolia out of Paris, which raised 2 million with us, Alvin Capital and Index, and then raised 18 uh, with Axel Partners, for example. Another example is a company called Contentful out of Berlin, which were exactly on the same track and raised money with Baldaton afterwards. So again, by building expertise on a specific topic, we can find a differentiator and potentially be more helpful for our portfolio entrepreneurs because I guess this is what VC is about, investing in the right company and trying to be the most helpful to, to these companies. Well, you folks do the same. You know, you're, you're, you have to distinguish yourself from the other sort of seed round, early stage investors by adding something beyond the cash. So what's your philosophy of that add-on and how do you accomplish it? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, I never talk about cash when I'm talking to early stage companies. Um, like Techstars, even though we have a 240 million VC fund and we have 28 accelerators in 18 countries, what we really talk about is that we're a worldwide network. And I think that's one of the most powerful things for an early stage company, particularly B2B SaaS, enterprise SaaS. I think really on two things, I know my own experience as a founder and like I actually found raising money a bit too easy, like we raised 8 million. Um, but what I found a lot harder was actually building, uh, getting access to the right networks of mentors at the early stage and getting credibility in the marketplace, particularly in the enterprise SaaS space. So for example, with Techstars, with having invested in a thousand companies um, over the last 10 years, um, we're really building that worldwide network. So we've just opened up, like two years ago, there was no Techstars in Berlin. There's now four Techstars programs in Berlin. That also shows the strength of the ecosystem in Berlin and Europe that it's maturing in terms of mentors and early stage investors that we can bring in around because we're mentor-led programs. Um, but the two things that we really offer, I think, is access. So companies who go on a Techstars program in the first three weeks meet 100 different mentors, uh, angel investors, VCs, guys from Point9, anyone who's local in the ecosystem who's very supportive and looking to invest as they go through their Series A and, and, and onwards. So we help you tap into that network. So we give you access. And then also we have 11,000 mentors globally that have worked with Techstars companies that you can literally access once you're in Techstars. And 28 other programs running all over the world from Seattle, Boulder, Dubai, um, Adelaide. Um, so we, we're, we're building up that footprint, so geographic and industry footprints. And then the second thing I think early stage founders really struggle with is credibility. So I used to ring up and say, hi, I'm Connor. I'm from Datahug. And they'd be like, who and what? Now, when we raised money early on from someone like Salesforce was one of our early investors and DFJ was one of our early investors, I actually would say, hi, I'm Connor, I'm from a Salesforce-backed company, blah, 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 and suddenly my conversion rate in phone calls and cold calls and introductions went up about 5x. Um, so by being able to say, hey, we're a tech stars company, gives you instant validation and credibility in the early stages, which helps you get that meeting. And the second thing is partnering with SAP, and SAP is probably one of the biggest tech giants in the world and definitely in Europe, ring up and say, hey, I'm John or Mary from X. We are backed by SAP and Techstars is a great way to accelerate your business in the early stages to get that meeting, to get that deal, to get that recruit across the line who's nervous, to get that first five, six, 20 customers that you need to build that momentum. And that's what we're all about, building that early momentum by unlocking our worldwide network. So how does the, how does the fact that you have these programs now 
not just in Silicon Valley anymore, but around the globe. How does that... The, the, the irony is we're not in Silicon Valley. We're everywhere but Silicon Valley is where Techstars is this kind of model. Ah. I think it was, it was started in Boulder, Colorado 10 years ago. I think they were sitting on the table saying entrepreneurs exist everywhere. I'm Irish, I'm living in Berlin, I lived in the US for years, I lived right. in Dubai. And I like the idea of Techstars coming to a local ecosystem, helping being almost like an API, being almost like um, a coral reef to help pull together the mentors at the local early stage. Um, founders and alumni bring them together and we believe entrepreneurs exist everywhere and we want to come to you and your ecosystem and build and strengthen those ecosystems whereas I think there's some other accelerators that are world-class they're like an API to San Francisco you come to San Francisco they'll plug you into everyone in San Francisco whereas we're going to go to other ecosystems and connect them together it's kind of been Texas growth strategy well, I want to pick up one of the things that Elizabeth mentioned which I'll translate to um, uh, labor arbitration which is uh, the differential between a, what it costs to hire a skilled programmer in Silicon Valley versus what it costs. Take one of your companies up uh, next to the Arctic Circle, Behaviosec. It literally is up next to the Arctic Circle, isn't it? It is. That's right. But I think uh, our strategy is to invest locally, but, uh, but uh, seek for market globally. And uh, we have a number of companies who have their tech hub here either in Stock nearby Stockholm or Helsinki or, or Tallinn, but uh, their sales offices are where the customers are. So New York is a great place for ad tech. Uh, you might go elsewhere for, for hardware deals, or London is a great place for, for uh, business SaaS companies. But uh, we have always tech teams uh, nearby the original source. And we have Lulaya-based company, we have one in Lund, which is headquartered in Silicon Valley, Neo Technology. We have uh, one in Linköping, or we had, and we have a few in Oulu. It's closest to the Arctic Circle. <laughs> sure. But is, is, is part of your observation and part of the, the due diligence and determining whether to invest based upon the fact that there's this significant differential in the cost of skilled labor that that you as an investor can take advantage of, along the lines that Elizabeth was talking about, where the opportunities to invest in really high quality teams, such as here in, in Tallinn, and throughout Estonia and throughout the Nordic and Baltic region, it's a, it's a lot lower cost. And you know, I deal with a lot of companies that say, well, we're gonna come to Silicon Valley, and I say, well, leave your tech team behind, because if they get off the plane, in San Francisco, there's somebody from Google or Facebook standing next to the exit from, uh, from Customs that'll hire you in a minute at triple your salary. And is that something that you have in mind as part of your investment strategy? Well, not, not maybe directly, but cost is only one thing, but uh, you also uh, get more loyal labor force in, in local places. I mean, people don't move so easily. That's a negative thing in Nordic countries. They have their summer cottage, their boat, their relatives, their families, that's a negative side of it. But positive is that if they have a job, they will stick the job. I mean, particularly in the times when Nokia and Ericsson and uh, big companies are laying off people, the technicians, the engineers, they are not uh, easily uh, moving to the next place because they get 5% uh, salary increase. They might stick with the job because they like the thing they are doing. And with the small startup company, you can do bigger things. It's not only the left-handed, but bottom in the, the mobile phone, but it might be the whole sort of IoT, some sort of box which is doing connectivity thing for the next uh, personal trainer. So I think people are loyal, and uh, I don't think we really use the strategy for low-cost labor as an investment decision, but I think it comes indirectly. Okay. Richard, if I may add yeah, please. one thing, uh, interesting story. Uh, at the DVN event in California, we met a company called Take the Interview, and one of the founders was Serbian. And um, we looked at the deal, and they ended up having a 15 engineering uh, engineer team in Belgrade that qualified the investment for us. And in most cases, we tried to take companies from our region to US, but in this case, we were actually bringing them to Europe. So we invested last year. They are doing great. They are an HR tech company. But we see in our portfolio as well this tandem connection between having a technical headquarters in our region for cost reasons, uh, continuation, and those kind of things. And then the commercial centers closer to Western Europe and US. Uh, and we see this as a pattern in our portfolio. 
and we have a U.S. office as well in Washington, D.C. And right now we are getting more U.S. companies coming to us and asking, hey, can we set up a tech office in, in your region? Can we launch a, um, you know, a small engineering team there? And then raising money from funds like ourselves because it's, it's a different ball game for them to come to Europe. Uh, there are different regulations here, data protection, those kind of things. Uh, and the market is less competitive. So when you look at Take the Interview, they are competing with Montage and Hireview, which have raised more money in the US. It's a more competitive market, but there is a little bit more, less resistance in this market. And when we are making an investment, we have to have a value creating component in our region. Uh, and in most cases, this is the tech team. Uh, but what we see is very similar that most companies are actually trying to balance this. And it's not that hard. If you have an East Coast commercial office, you're on the same day. On the West Coast, it's a little bit more challenging because you're living two days. Um, but it's a pattern that we see and we enjoy. I mean, most of the companies are, that the burn rates are much, much lower because of this. I, I'd like to pick up one of the points that, that you made, and it was actually talked about in the first panel uh, this morning uh, during the talking about acquisitions, which is the idea that, that companies that have obtained funding need to constantly be out there networking and, and making connections on their own, in addition to the connections that are supplied by the venture capital investors as they work their networks to get their companies connected. The, the, the CEO has got to be constantly out there pitching what they're doing, even if the possibilities of raising capital, for example, the Estonian company that got acquired by the climate group, uh, you know, he was going to conferences in San Francisco the possibility of an American venture fund investing directly into an Estonian company, it happens, as we know from Thunderbeam, but it's, it's really the exception. So why, why, are, why are the CEOs doing this? Why are they traveling around the world exposing you know, their companies? You know, you have a portfolio, group of portfolio companies. Are they all staying close to home in Poland, or are they you know, getting around and exposing what they're doing to potential customers? Are, and are they all working the local economy, or do they start with a global vision? Well, Poland is in this a little bit of a um, kind of a situation where you have a large market locally. 36 million is a relatively large market. <laughs> And unfortunately, a lot of the startup founders see that as an opportunity to grow something before they go global. Now, it's very difficult to get out of that mentality later on. So actually, it's much better if the founders um, straight away think globally, like they do in Estonia, being a small country. In Poland, that's not always the case. We always help our companies to get, first of all, other investors that are from abroad, into the company, whether they are VCs or angels, but we are looking to build the networks like that. It happens often that on the HR situation, some people are just not available on the Polish market. Uh, we have a case of an e-commerce company which set up its marketing department in Berlin because there simply they could hire maybe one of 40 people who send their CVs to, a, to be a CMO. In Poland, maybe they had a choice between one and two. So they need to be global, not just to reach their customers. Obviously, technology companies that sell via the internet have to be global to reach their customers, and their customers can be anywhere, but also for other reasons. So it's not just the customer reach. Um, sometimes we see a good balance in our companies between the IT developers locally in Poland and then some advisors or uh, technology people in other countries because they bring in new skills that we simply don't have. But I think on the Central European region, the, the marketing and sales side is the one that needs the most and needs this kind of relationship with the US or with Western Europe. Uh, one interesting case, one of our companies has decided it's not going to go west, it's going to go east. So they set up a sales office in Shanghai, originally in Hong Kong, now they've moved to Shanghai, and they're expanding across China. They have a billion Chinese smartphones now in their network. And the second step is they've just gone into Japan three weeks ago. Um, what they, how they were able to do that. They were able to do that because of a very close relationship that they built with L'Oreal, 
which then looks how to help them go right across Asia. And upon L'Oreal, they've gone into Founders Factory Accelerator in London and then onto French brands. Um, and they're supporting those in Asian countries, which is a very good market now for luxury products. So it's interesting how you don't need to go maybe west. Maybe look for a way to go east and, and find a market there for yourself. But that's, that's, that's an example of, of, of leveraging a whole range of international connections. Connections for talent, connections for market opportunities, connections for customer growth, uh, potential for acquisition of capital in the larger term. How do you how do you actually facilitate something like that, Magnus? How do you how do you get companies to to have their attention span focused on the fact that yeah we're the hottest company in Lund, right next to the new high-class accelerator system that they built on the outskirts of Lund. Um, there's there's plenty of opportunity to do science there, but how do you how do you how do you instill the, in the mentality of the teams that you're going to fund the idea that they can't just sit there and learn. They, they, even, even from the standpoint of doing the science, they need to be connected around the world. Well, uh, in our case, um, Sweden has always been sort of an export-driven country in high-tech business. So there is a known fact that the domestic market is not very big for, for the products. And what we've done... Uh, a little well, bigger than Estonia, though. A little bigger than Estonia, that's true. But the products, many of the products are global products that are sold and uh, in what we've done uh, so I don't think we have that issue so much and our biggest issue has been finding the right talent for the things we do hmm. and uh, someone here mentioned that there was a heart you had to go to Berlin right and what we've done is we import the talent uh, in our company one of the companies I'm involved with half of the people or more are non-Swedish our CEOs from Silicon Valley we have people from all over Europe that move to Sweden to, do, to work with us, and from Asia, everywhere. And we go for the best people in the world we can find that are high-tech geeks that fit into our model. And we actually are able to attract them, and we, we pay what it takes, even though that, and that's less than we would pay in Silicon Valley. So we import them, and then with that, uh, we also get the outreach because obviously they're comfortable going anywhere in the world and so forth. So it worked pretty well. A and uh, uh, so uh, that's yeah. kind of how we We have a it. little problem with the reverse of that in the United States because of uh, uh, the present administration's uh, attitude towards uh, work visas and the fact that the current system we attract people to come to, you know, world-class universities in the United States, like Berkeley, where I went. Not everybody went to Stanford. Um, but as soon as they're done, as soon as they've got their PhD, we send them home. Now, this is a good thing for their home country, but from the United States perspective and from the perspective of growing companies in Silicon Valley, um, it's, it's not necessarily a good thing. But one of the things I wanted to, do, to touch on uh, and it, it relates to Thunderbeam and the Draper Venture Network. The Draper Venture Network, as you heard earlier, is a network of, of venture funds all under the umbrella that, that Tim Draper put together, headquartered in San Mateo next to Draper University. They have an annual meeting of their venture funds, and at that meeting they showcase companies. And one of the companies that was showcased there two years ago was Thunderbeam. And so you can see that, that this internationalization is, is going on in a, in a variety of different models. And so back to you, Elizabeth, you know, you, the companies that you've invested in, whether they're in Italy or in China or wherever they are, ultimately they need to scale up. Right. So how do you as an angel investor who don't have the resources of being connected to some vast network like the Draper Venture Network or the funds the size that Magnus is talking about and, and uh, Connor Ventures. How do, how do you help them scale up? Um, that's a, gr a great question. Um, I ask the hard ones. <laughs> <laughs> well, as an angel investor, I tend to um, invest at early stage. Then when we are ready to do our A round, 
what I would do is um, share my deal flows with the larger VC friends of mine. And we will strategically figure out which VCs we want to play with. Um, some will be in other countries, and this is how we could launch our product and services in elsewhere outside of the United States or the other way around. So if it's a European-based company or a Chinese-based company and they want to come to America, then we will work with um, American VCs. And then this is how they go across the pond back and forth. Does so, that make sense? So, so you have to spend some of your time, yes. your investment capital, personal investment capital, yes. not just the money, personal investment capital in not only finding the potential portfolio companies, but also worrying about the, the next, next step, round. the upstream, which right. is, so is this something that uh, Kleiner Perkins is going to invest in, uh, Andreessen exactly. Horowitz, exactly. Draper Fisher, you know. Right. So that's, that's what your, that's your solution to this right. problem. Right. So I just invested in a company. They, uh, they're all ex Goldman Sachs boys, graduates of YC. Our R&D is in India. The product is going to be based in India. It's a micro fund. Um, we eventually got a bunch of American investors. And then um, I shared my deal flow with a couple of my European friends. Um, and they went aboard on it because they saw the list of people. And basically, um, the European VCs are wanting to get in bed with a couple of the American VCs. Um, and, and because of that cross-pollination happening, you build relationships and you increase your network. And because of that, then you can just go from one vertical to the next vertical. And for us to go into, like, let's say Africa, if we have an African VC, we can easily integrate that microfinancing in Africa quicker than if we, and, and they, they, they know the market. They already know the scene. They know where all the dead bodies are. And so it helps us move to the next region quicker. Well, when, when, when the companies that you've invested in, this is question back to the two of you, because you're investing at really early stage as well, where do the next round investors come from? Are they all local to the particular accelerator in Berlin or Shanghai or, or uh, you know, wherever? Or are, is capital flowing in from places that are a little remote from the actual location of the team and the company and the, the program that you put them through. But I think just, just to add, to, to, before I answer that, like relationships are everything in this business. Like I basically get paid to network. And I think most investors, that's their job. It's to network. Uh, it's kind of an amazing job. But one side you're talking to startups and the other side you're talking to the next investors who you're going to be deal flow for and feeding them. So you have to understand what are they looking for, how can you help them. So when you do invest in your teams, you can bring them to those next investors. And I think um, I look at some of the, like the one of the most famous angel investors in the world is Ron Conway uh, in Silicon Valley, SD Angel. And that's what he does. And we had him, we were lucky to have him as an early investor in one of my last companies. You come into his apartment, you, you give him the pitch, he sits down, takes out 50 sheets of paper and goes, I'm going to give you 10 introductions. I'm just going to give you 10. Work those 10, come back to me, I'll give you another 10. And that's his value. And he's one of the most successful. He was in Twitter, Google, Facebook, I think nearly everything. Um, and that's a really good, um, I think, investor does that, understands what the teams need, when they need it, where they need it, and if they can unlock those networks on the other side um, for those companies, whether it's corporates, whether it's recruits, whether it's customers, whether it's partners, or more importantly, in, in many scenarios, for growth, venture capitalists. So that's billing relationships. So, so what about your portfolio companies? How do, you, how do you pull this magic trick? So I think I speak about SaaS companies because this is what I know uh, about. And I, I think one thing that we should keep in mind is that like 50% of the software spend in the world are in the US. So if you're a European company and you don't go to the US, you have a very, very tiny chance to become a billion dollar company. So if you're a European VC fund, and you want to invest mainly into European startups, one of the most important points in your value proposition is actually to help companies doing the switch from European companies to the US. And if you look at Zendesk, they spent some years in Denmark and then went to the US. And all our portfolio companies that are now into this like 100 million to $1 billion valuation, they all went to the US. 
And then, so, the, and then you should, the question that we should wonder about is, is the VC the right person to actually help you make this switch, or should you actually build another network? And so, again, what we try to do is to build a global portfolio for that. So having portfolio companies that are seed stage company in the US, it helps us a lot. This developer tool company out of Germany can go to Algolia's office in San Francisco, and then suddenly you build these like, strong ties between uh, portfolio companies, so that helps. And then I think it's changing a little bit now, and like USV, for example, invest here in Estonia, and I was actually quite astonished with that. But most of the biggest VC firm in the US, they're gonna start considering your company only if you start having revenues in the US. So what we try to do and what we advise a lot of, of our portfolio entrepreneurs is to start selling in the US before they go raise Series A. So if you can show that, I don't know, let's say you can sell to two or three accounts in the US, you don't necessarily have the playbook all written, but you can show, you can show that you can sell yourself, then it becomes way easier to raise uh, with US VCs. So yeah, if I try to sum it up, building this global portfolio helps, and then building strong ties with like US VCs once you've been able to sell uh, in the US. But again, I think this is changing a little okay. bit. All right, the clock's running down here. Who's, where's the box? OK, who's got, we've got time for a couple of questions before we uh, they cut our air supply. Um, so I'm from the States, and I was just wondering, because I'm helping out some startups here in, um, uh, in Estonia. Uh, would you guys say that, that we, we absolutely need to be in touch with the VCs when opening up a US-based office, or should we just bootstrap? What are your thoughts on that? Who wants to yeah. answer that? Yeah, I mean, I, I, can, I can take it. So I think you don't need to raise capital before going to the US. I think there are a lot of like co-working space. I think, I don't know if you know about Jason Lemkin, which has this like Sastar co-selling co space now. I think it's, you can just go there, and I think, I mean, we envy a lot of the US for different reasons, but one thing is that you can actually sell in a faster manner. So I guess going to the US once you're bootstrapped and like, start selling there is actually a possibility. It go, you know, just everyone in the room needs to understand that the, the cost of doing business in Silicon Valley is about three or four X in what it is here. Uh, there's a constriction in the housing supply, there's a constriction in the labor force and, and the amounts of capital. While there are huge piles of capital, it, it definitely expensive. So it's not for the, the timid or the faint of heart in terms of looking at the expenses of, of going to Silicon Valley, well, which I'm sure is part of the lessons that you're teaching your portfolio companies. Well, the, le the lesson I learned in, in, from Europe uh, doing something similar going to the US was the analogy I had was Silicon Valley was like the Disney World for startups. And you imagine these amazing fundraising activities, amazing valuations, amazing entrepreneurs. And you get there, and it's like really going to Disney World. There's three or queues to get in the door to that ride. Everybody is going there after that limited amount of capital. And you got to, how do you take a shortcut in that queue? It's through the relationships and networking. And that takes time. You can't just fly in and just expect to get that meeting. Um, so you have to spend time on the ground there. So I think it's a false fallacy, I think, both at the start, that you're going to like land in Silicon Valley, close a $5 million deal straight away. I think that's the, that's the signal that our time is up. <laughs> Let's have a round of applause for our, for our panel.